Aldo wanted to be a teacher. He was studying at the Ayotzinapa Teacher Training College in the Mexican state of Guerrero. But one bullet changed everything. This footage shows the fateful moment. Aldo and around 50 other students had commandeered public buses to get back to their college after a demonstration. Such actions aren't unusual in parts of Mexico. Suddenly, police stopped the bus and then opened fire on the unarmed students. Hit by a bullet, Aldo fell to the ground. Six students were shot dead. Two more were seriously wounded. 43 students, all aged between 18 and 23, were abducted. They've never been seen since, just like thousands of others in Mexico. A number of police officers were subsequently arrested, accused of carrying out the murders. A number of the weapons used in those crimes were German military-grade G36 assault rifles made by Heckler & Koch. But the German government hadn't approved their export to this region. So how did they get there? A court in the city of Stuttgart took up the case. The almost year-long trial was Germany's most detailed investigation of an arms deal to date. The verdict surprised many. The case was initially brought by Jürgen Gresslin, a prominent opponent of Germany's arms industry. The managers have walked away free. That's the big scandal and proof of a two-class judicial system. So were the managers of Heckler & Koch not responsible for the illegal weapons deal in the opinion of the court? It is the conviction of this chamber that there was insufficient evidence to suggest the other defendants took part in the crimes. Hence, the acquittal. Thank you. So what actually happened? It all began in 2005. German arms manufacturer Heckler & Koch wanted to export thousands of G36 assault rifles to Mexico, along with submachine guns. So the company submitted an application to the German Economics Ministry in Berlin. But the Foreign Ministry expressed concern, citing human rights violations by Mexican security forces, including abductions and murder in Guerrero and other states. The Economics Ministry sought a compromise. Meanwhile, Heckler & Koch was waiting impatiently for permission to export as the company's then sales representative for Mexico explains. We can only identify him as Marcus B. We were then asked by sales whether we could change the designated end-use certificate, because some ministry had requested that certain aspects shouldn't be mentioned. Heckler and Koch had originally presented this end-use certificate from the Mexican Defense Ministry to the German Economics Ministry. The details of this certificate showed clearly that the weapons were partly intended for Mexican states considered particularly dangerous. So I wrote an email to my wife from the computer of at Heckler & Koch asking her to ask the head of DCAM, the official body responsible for arms sales in Mexico, whether it was possible not to name these three states and to issue a new end use. So, once the economics ministry had informed Heckler & Koch which Mexican states would not be approved, the company submitted a new end use certificate where the critical states were no longer mentioned. But the strange thing was, the exact same number of guns would still be supplied to Mexico, which surely should have been noticed. But approval for the export was given, and the deal began. Over the following years, a team from Heckler & Koch traveled all over Mexico, showing police officers and the army how to use the firearms. Here they are in Colima, but they also went to the states that were supposedly banned, including Guerrero, where the weapons would soon be used. On 19-year-old Aldo Gutierrez Solano, for example, 
This was him dancing at his brother's wedding, just days before security forces would destroy his life forever. He was a rascal, cheeky and clever, and always happy. He was always in a good mood. He was never fearful or shy, just always very happy. I have such fond memories of Aldo. He was a very happy guy, always having fun. And he loved to dance. He was a clever child, really bright. He was always keen to see everything and to learn. That's why he went to college. Now all that's gone. Details of that night haunt the family. Aldo's brother, Leonel, tells us what happened. There were a number of buses. Aldo was in the first one. When the attack started, they were already heading back to the college. First, the police started pursuing them. Then a police vehicle blocked the junction ahead to stop them leaving the city. So the students got out of the bus. Aldo was one of the first to get out. He wanted to talk to the police who were blocking the road in the hope that they could proceed. But the police immediately started shooting. The other students got off the buses and started filming with their cell phones. When Aldo was hit by a bullet, the others screamed for help. They called an ambulance for their friend while running for cover themselves. More shots fell. That same night, Aldo's family rushed to the hospital. I saw him, and he had a bullet wound to his head. The bullet went in here and came out here. Aldo had been lying in the hospital for hours without treatment. Only when his family turned up did things start to happen. 65% of his brain was damaged. He didn't get treated even though he had serious injuries. No one took care of him. The doctors did nothing, despite his serious condition. Drug cartels kill thousands in Mexico every year, but the security forces are also responsible for many deaths. One of the Heckler and Koch gun instructors started to have doubts. When you look at the drug wars there and the corruption, which no doubt go hand in hand. Then surely it's irresponsible to supply weapons, given the serious doubts as to what they will be used for, and against whom. In 2010, he testified to state prosecutors against his former employer, Heckler & Koch. It was a damning indictment of colleagues and managers that led to two police raids on the company premises and a mammoth investigation. It took eight long years, from the start of the investigation to the trial opening in May 2018. In 2018, the largest trial of its kind in German post-war history finally got underway. As always, video and audio recordings were not permitted, but trial observers took detailed minutes. Jan van Aachen was one of them. He was previously a weapons inspector for the United Nations and a member of the German parliament. This is the area for spectators. At times it was really full, particularly at the start of the trial and the end. I mostly sat here at the front. We took notes on the entire trial for the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. So let's go to the front. This is where the defendants sat. One defendant at each table plus one or two attorneys each. Over here were also representatives from Heckler and Koch. The presiding judge then sat here at the front, 
together with all the associate judges. And the witness stand was there. So they were questioned from here, also by the state prosecutors who sat there. There were always two or three of them. We had 28 courtroom days, spread over almost an entire year. I remember three things from the first day. Firstly, the charges were read out, which included conspiring to commit crime. The second was that the two main suspects weren't in the room. One has since died. The other was Heckler & Koch's Mexico representative, who lives in Mexico, and was allegedly not well enough to travel. So his trial was separated off. The defendants included ex-CEO Peter Bayerle and another former Heckler & Koch CEO, two past employees from the marketing division, the company Heckler & Koch itself is a co-defendant, and a secretary from the export department. The third thing I remember was the initial statements given by the accused, where it was totally clear they had no sense of guilt, and I think they were really serious about that. The argument was they had received approval for exports to Mexico, and so they exported to Mexico. They couldn't work out why they were in court. The end-use certificate is the centerpiece of Germany's arms control mechanism. In this document, the buyer declares where the weapons will be delivered and where they will be used, ruling out that they will end up anywhere else. Several different ministries examine the application under the direction of the economics ministry. The government's export control office, BAFA, then takes care of the licensing procedure. Arnold Wallraff was president of BAFA for 10 years. He's well acquainted with the procedures and knows those who worked in the economics ministry during the period in question. In the Heckler & Koch case, the colleague involved at the economics ministry was not someone who exercised any particularly critical judgment in that regard, shall we say. <laughs> That official, who was in a senior position in the economics ministry, was one of the first witnesses to be called. His testimony got off to an uncomfortable start. The witness was asked by the presiding judge to disclose what the Mexico deal was all about. He answered, one moment, and put a huge briefcase on the table. He pulled out an entire file. The judge asked him what he was doing. He said, I need the file on the investigation to get the indictment. And you could see the faces of the state prosecutors turning red because that's not allowed. That a witness in a German criminal court case is holding the indictment in his hands. But that wasn't the end of it. During questioning, the witness revealed that the other ministries also had access to the confidential files. But where they came from, that bit he couldn't remember. And then he actually stated in court, we're called the ministry for the economy. We have a special interest in ensuring that these manufacturers can survive economically. That's from the man responsible for regulating arms exports. For decades, Heckler & Koch has been a key supplier to the German armed forces and the police. It's considered to have systemic relevance. So does the economics ministry give special treatment to a company like that? We decided to ask former economics minister, Sigmar Gabriel. The official began his statement by saying, we are the ministry for the economy, so the ministry wants this key manufacturer to survive. That's true, but the export guidelines state that when it comes to arms exports, economic considerations and jobs are not to play a role. That's the legal position. I hope the court is familiar with the export guidelines. Back to the courtroom. Under further questioning by the presiding judge, the official from the economics ministry stated, from the witness stand, that human rights were more a work of endeavor. These are the people charged with safeguarding our highest value, namely human rights. 
in all constitutions, in our constitution. And they see it merely as a work of endeavor? So if it happens to suit, then we'll include that too. But otherwise, we're not interested. Human rights as a work of endeavor? That's not what the approval guidelines set out by the government state. They conclude with the sentence, for this question, the human rights situation in the recipient country plays a prominent role. For me, also coming from a legal background, it's clear that it's an absolute test criterion and a deal-breaking criterion. The official in charge should have been very familiar with the guidelines. He'd spent 15 years working in weapons export control. This official had been in the job for 15 years. I know that's a very long time. Very long. Why was nothing done? You need to ask my predecessors, I don't know. So you replaced him quickly. I think he moved positions before I came. He was replaced December 2015. Okay, then it was in my time. Mr. Machnik replaced him. We certainly looked at the Mexico case very closely and realized we needed to take him out of the firing line, literally. We wonder if it's normal for a senior official like that to remain in one department for so many years. No, in a ministry you almost never have people remaining in one sphere of influence for so long. Of course, affinities and relationships would develop. An internal email exchange between the official in question and the export control office, BAFA, certainly suggests such an affinity. It concerns an additional export license, which the official refers to as a special law for Heckler & Koch. Then he says the company should be ordered not to broadcast this fact to a wider circle. When you spend 10 years working day in, day out with the same buddies? Further emails and memos reveal that the same official repeatedly gave out internal information to the company. A witness from the foreign ministry actually testified here that he had appealed to the economics ministry in writing to stop passing on their information to Heckler & Koch. And even that letter was passed to the company. The economics ministry insists to this day that it has never divided Mexico into positive and negative states. That's surprising. Because in this email, the ministry informs Heckler & Koch of exactly that division. This here is an email from the ministry to Heckler & Koch CEO, Peter Bayerle. It includes a list. The lower part of the email is interesting. It lists so-called positive and negative states. Here it says negative states. Agua Calientes, Nuevo León, Queretao. That's very specific. But is that the role of the economics ministry? No, it's certainly unusual. It's very chummy. Was it that chummy relationship that drove the decisions on weapons exports? Opting for a strategy of dividing Mexico into positive and negative states, which is highly questionable under international law. That was the point that we considered completely unrealistic. You have to imagine there's a country, and they're supposed to say, these are our weapons supplies. But if you get deployed tomorrow, you can only take them to these parts of our country, but not these parts. It's ridiculous. That isn't the way the police or military work. And so in our estimation, that strategy was inappropriate. Some people said it was an apparent export restriction. And actually, they would have all known that it wouldn't work that way in practice. Anyway, it was certainly clear to us that this strategy was unsuitable, and so we no longer allowed it. And indeed, the official from the economics ministry admitted himself, while testifying to the Customs Investigation Bureau, 
that he realized the firearms had only been excluded from parts of Mexico on paper. But the economics ministry denies any wrongdoing. The ministry's main contact at Heckler & Koch was Peter Bayerle. He was in the dock at Stuttgart, but he was acquitted. On day two of the trial, Peter Bayerle stated that these end-use certificates are, and I quote, the wrong instruments and ineffective. This supposed wrong instrument has for decades been the basis for all of Germany's arms exports. Peter Bayerle had been the head judge at a district court before moving to Heckler & Koch. Initially, he was the company's liaison officer for the authorities and then later CEO. Throughout, he was responsible for export applications and end-use agreements. Without an end-use certificate, weapons exports can't be authorized. The company has to decide whether or not to take the risk. You need end-use certificates and you need to monitor them. The Export Control Office, BAFA, also understands that the end-use agreement is a binding document. According to our understanding of the law, the end-use certificate is an integral part of the licensing. Yet, veteran legal expert Peter Bayerle argued in court that end-use certificates are not decisive for arms exports, and he claimed to know nothing of the reworked certificate for Mexico. But his correspondence with the chummy official at the economics ministry tells a different story. I wasn't aware of this email before. It's completely clear here. The economics ministry is telling Heckler & Koch, you can't export to these Mexican states, but these other ones are OK. And yet in the trial, all those involved maintained repeatedly that there had never been a list of positive and negative states. It's absurd that this has only turned up now. Then there's also a very revealing memo from a secretary. The words are said to be Mr. Byerless. Ten Mexican states rejected, six positive, weapons to be distributed in a plausible way between the six positive states. That's incredible. We have a statement from the secretary saying, he said we should distribute the arms in a plausible way between the six acceptable states. And that wasn't included in the trial. In the courtroom he always acted as if he knew nothing. And yet here he's said to have given this instruction. The word plausible clearly suggests the intention is not only to supply those six states, but to redistribute them for the purposes of the end-use certificate. That's unbelievable. But that's not all. When the approval of arms exports to Mexico did not appear forthcoming, Bayerle emailed colleagues suggesting they pursued what he called the political route. The company made donations to the constituency offices of influential politicians, like Volker Kauda, for example. He was the parliamentary leader of Angela Merkel's conservative bloc. Shortly afterwards, Bayerle wrote to Kauda, Today I must once again trouble you about that vexed subject of export licenses to third states. How are we to understand this? We can't expect any positive decision in the coming months. We only have the political route left. We should make donations to the CDU and the very receptive FDP. Then that was done and then... And it didn't help. Money down the drain. You would think so. But the interesting thing is, a short while later, Mr. contacted the company to ask for more information about the case. I think that is a very, how shall I put it, folklorish idea of how politics works. And yet the documents show. A few days after the donation and the email, the economics ministry department responsible got in touch with Heckler & Koch to provide help with the export application. We contacted Volker Kauder's office for a response, but were told, Mr. Kauder filled out a questionnaire for the state prosecutor's office and now considers the matter closed. Volker Kauder was also not willing to talk to us personally. I wanted to ask you about Heckler and Koch. expressly said no. Because of the donations? 
We tried to speak to Peter Bayerler too as he emerged from the court one day. His lawyer Dietrich Quedenfeld blocked our cameraman, pulling out the sound cable. Peter Bayerler began brandishing his briefcase and his lawyer continued to attempt to obstruct us. Mr. Bayerle, what do you know about the party donations? About Heckler and Koch? They were clearly not willing to talk about donations to politicians. Monitoring the end use of Heckler and Koch's arms exports during Bayerle's tenure proved difficult. We know that from the standard reliability tests that the Export Control Office, BAFA, carried out on the gunmaker. In his final report, the inspector from BAFA found there was no confirmation of any monitoring that took place. BAFA has one particularly potent weapon at its disposal for ensuring its rules are adhered to the agency can rescind a company's certified reliability as an arms exporter. It's clear the BAFA inspector was furious. He wrote to Peter Bayerle, a continuation of the aforementioned deficits can lead to the re-evaluation of your company's reliability and thereby its capacity to gain export licenses. We showed the inspection papers to Jan van Aken, who was seeing them for the first time. And no action was taken? <laughs> Um, we have As members of parliament back then, we often ask the government, how was the decision reached to declare a company no longer reliable? And when I now read that report and know that the Federal Export Control Office considered Heckler & Koch totally unreliable, that thousands of military weapons went undocumented, it's incredible. I just find it unbelievable. As a lawmaker, I never heard anything about these allegations. And we asked a lot of questions about Heckler and Koch. And the complaints from the BAFA inspector clearly had no impact on the government's behavior towards Heckler and Koch. In Mexico, meanwhile, the families of the 43 missing students are still searching for the bodies of their loved ones. More than 60,000 people are classified as missing in Mexico, presumed dead. The appearance of the stones help us to locate graves. I can see these stones were previously under the ground. So I know the ground has been dug over here. You see the difference in the colour? The stone was on the surface, the other one was buried deeper. The remains of clothing are scattered across this site. A putrid smell hangs in the air. I still hope that my son will walk through the door one day. The pain is unbearable. It just hurts so much. But I'm not giving up, not until I found my son. Every time I come up to these hills, even though I'm sick, I still forget my illness because I want to find out something about my son. Mexico has never forgotten the missing student teachers. For more than five years, thousands of people have been taking to the streets every month to demand answers. They include families and friends of the 43 students who disappeared. Human rights lawyer Sofia de Robina represents the families. I'm an attorney at the Miguel Augustin Pujara's Human Rights Center and have been legally accompanying the Ayazinapa case for four years. We represent relatives of the 43 students who disappeared on the 26th of September 2014, as well as the students who were executed and also those who were injured that night. Aldo Gutierrez Solano is one of my clients. Even traveling in the crisis-torn state of Guerrero is dangerous. The lawyer takes us to Aldo's family. Civilian militia groups have taken control of the roads and levy so-called customs duties. We're at the mercy of the local commanders. 
Terus. When they spot our camera, things get a bit edgy. Guerrero has been scarred by the drug war, by violence and corruption. The Gutierrez family is taking care of Aldo in this house built with donations. We have suffered a lot as a family because we have to struggle with everything. Ultimately, we wish for nothing more than to see this little lively guy again who we've lost. The family still clings to the hope that Aldo will get well again even if this is medically impossible. He listens. He listens closely. Sometimes he opens his eyes when you talk to him, and then he closes them again. We take care of him. Every day we come here and we take care of him. All day and all night, we take care of him. And yes, he can hear, and he responds too. And does he respond to you? Yes, definitely. Just yesterday, he moved his finger. Even in a coma, he still moves. The hopes of a mother the hopes of a family. We are here. We miss him very much. The whole family loves him so much. That's why it's so hard for us to see the change that he's undergone. I won't abandon you. I'll be with you, no matter what happens. Meanwhile, the trial in Stuttgart was continuing. Evidence was presented and the court called dozens of witnesses. Then, on the 20th day, something completely unexpected happened. Lawyer Holger Rothbauer looks back. I was present. Everyone was completely shocked when the presiding judge said, thousands of emails were missing. How could that happen? I mean, this was a police operation. How is that possible? It's beyond belief. And suddenly the number was clear. 15,000 emails had slipped through. That created a bit of a shock up there on the bench. They realized they suddenly had a lot of documents here that hadn't been included in the proceedings at all. An investigation was launched into the missing emails. Where were they? Then the name of an auditing company came up, KPMG. Then it turned out the Customs Criminal Investigation Office, leading the investigation, had received the emails, the documents, from KPMG, but they had already been filtered and sorted. Heckler and Koch called in KPMG shortly after police searched its headquarters. Part of their task was to evaluate the staff's electronic communications. Marcos B. was the company's sales representative in Mexico. In fact, Heckler and Koch had asked KPMG to carry out an internal voluntary investigation. Incomprehensible. Why? It's enough for the prosecutor to investigate, the police and so on. KPMG is one of the world's four largest auditing companies. The internal investigation was supposed to support the Customs Criminal Investigation Office, Baden-Württemberg State Criminal Police Office, and the Public Prosecutor's Office. 
Now, quite simply, they volunteer to commission an independent office to conduct interviews. Ecklenkoch's strategy is always to do things on a voluntary basis. They call it cooperation with the public prosecutor's office. And I was simply not prepared to take part in the interviews, because the questions were leading us down a slippery slope. They weren't what they claimed to be. Other employees decided to cooperate and joined company lawyers in a hotel at the Zurich airport for a crisis meeting. Shortly afterwards, two of them were fired along with Mexico representative Marcus B. All three of them were accused of illegal arms dealing. Wolfram Ziegelmeier still represents Marcus B. and is critical of the fact that the state investigators had agreed to cooperate with the private auditors. On the one hand, it is not justifiable and, in my view, not acceptable that the public prosecutor's office should agree that Heckler & Koch of all companies, which is the target of the accusations, should be given the opportunity to become involved in the investigations by commissioning an internal expert report that it paid KPMG a lot of money to produce. Why did the authorities agree to cooperate with KPMG in the first place? How close was that cooperation? The KPMG report confirms the cooperation with the police, customs investigators, and the prosecutor's office. The customs investigators say they exchanged information with KPMG for three years. This is the reason I believe that we also have these so-called pawns in the dark. We do not have the people actually responsible for the whole story, for initiating it in the dock. Those people are probably more likely to be found in departments of the Federal Ministry of Economics, or the people at the top of Heckler & Koch, and perhaps of the Federal Ministry. The KPMG investigation said there were significant irregularities in the stories of the secretary, a marketing employee, and the representative in Mexico and said they were primarily responsible for the crooked arms deals there. And how did the court deal with the 15,000 missing emails sent during the period in which those deals were made? When the affair came to light, neither the prosecution, the defendants, nor the court itself objected. There was no further discussion of how the emails could have disappeared in the first place. And only then, during the ongoing proceedings, did the parties receive the documents. The presiding judge told them to consider them outside the hearing. He should have then pursued the matter. So, people, if thousands of males are missing here, which is especially important for the question, who knew what when, that's central in this case. And then it just remains open. Not much happens. Something is then distributed in the so-called self-reading procedure. The public does not get to hear the evidence in court, and nobody knows what the judgment is really based on. That is not how a public, criminal trial, especially in such a significant case, should be. What the auditors also overlooked were the purchase contracts with Mexico on which the deals had been based. Heckler and Koch and the Mexican Ministry of Defense exchanged dozens of purchase contracts. We have these original contracts. They explicitly list the destinations of the weapons, including the banned Mexican states, such as Guerrero. Unlike the end-use certificate the company provided the government. The court in Stuttgart has refused to comment on the proceedings of the ruling. In answer to a written request, the Stuttgart Public Prosecutor's Office said the cooperation with KPMG had been helpful. But it also points out that KPMG's findings had also been compared with the information gathered by the office and critically assessed. KPMG had also been advising the Defense Ministry, which was looking for a successor model to the German Armed Forces standard assault rifle. Heckler and Koch was the favorite to win the tender. 
We've asked KPMG, but the company has refused to make any comment. Christian Schliemann from the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights is acting on behalf of the family of Aldo Gutierrez. We know that these weapons were also used in Aguila that night. And projectiles were also found from these Heckler and Koch weapons at various other crime scenes where attacks on the students were carried out. That is, we also have evidence to show they were fired to exert violence on the students, so to speak. Files from the Mexican prosecutor's office show dozens of Heckler and Koch G36 assault rifles were used in the attacks. Aldo was the person who was shot that night, and projectiles from Heckler and Koch weapons were also found at his crime scene. And this is exactly where we come full circle. From the illegal exports from Germany to the use of the weapons. We, of course, believe that the company that exported the weapons bears a responsibility. In September 2018, accompanied by his lawyers, Aldo's brother Leonel traveled to Stuttgart for the trial. The court had already rejected the family's request to appear as joint plaintiff in the criminal proceedings. In the court's opinion, the alleged illegal deliveries did not contribute to the concrete acts of injury in question. In the courtroom, Leonel took two photos of his brother out of his backpack because, as he later said, Aldo could not attend the trial himself. the court reacted swiftly. The way the court officials reacted, I thought I was in real trouble. It had been proven that the weapons in question had been used and had seriously injured my brother. The photos clearly show it. And then I thought, they want to accuse me of coming here, to another country, to make some kind of demands. Nine court officers surrounded the guest from Mexico until he gave them the pictures of his brother Aldo. It was all about equipment up there. It was all about files and stuff. No one ever talked about the victims, and I think it's important in this whole discussion about arms exports, not only in the trial, to make that clear from time to time. This is about death, this is about blood, this is about war, and not just about sewing machines and refrigerators. And that is why this is a very, very special moment for me. Only when Leone left the courthouse did he get the pictures of his brother back. We are used to always finding closed doors when it comes to justice. But the families of Ayotzinapa have taught us to keep on fighting and to demand justice, even if our presence is unwelcome. The relatives are here and will continue to fight for Aldo. It is a great pity that there's no interest in further communication to find out what the real consequences are. It is easier to look away and remain ignorant of the consequences that arms sales have for people on other continents and just continue with business as usual. It was the end of Leona's visit to Germany. In February 2019, the court gave its verdict. The secretary received a 17-month suspended sentence and had to perform 250 hours of community service. A former marketing employee was sentenced to 22 months on probation and had to pay an 80,000 euro fine to social organizations. Heckler and Koch was fined 3.7 million euros approximately the contract value of the illegally exported weapons. The other defendants, including the two former CEOs, were acquitted. Both Heckler and Koch and Peter Bayerle have refused to give any interviews, but deny any wrongdoing. Peter Bayerle used to be president of the regional court. The court considered his past performance as a jurist should be considered a mitigating factor. 
But what has a judge achieved that I or a driver or a cleaning lady hasn't? Nothing at all. Lawyers assessing each other and finding grounds for mitigation? No way. The public prosecutor's office decided not to appeal against the acquittal of Bayerle and the other ex-CEO while appealing the other rulings. What was really striking was the way that the presiding judge was assessing the issue from the outset. In the end, he ruled that the original charge didn't apply because the sale had been approved to Mexico and the end use certificates weren't part of the permit. The company did nothing wrong there. We are convinced, said the presiding judge in his oral verdict, that neither an end use certificate as such nor the actual end use can be made a part of the permit in terms of administrative law. But the former head of BAFA, the government's export control office, doesn't agree. Administrative law is quite clear. They are part of it. But if I may put it cautiously, criminal lawyers who do not deal with these things so often may see things differently. And that was probably so in the Stuttgart ruling. Two months after the Stuttgart ruling, a court in Kiel came to a different conclusion than the court in southern Germany. At the trial of the German arms manufacturer Zig Zawa for illegal arms exports, end use certificates were judged to be part of the export licenses. Zig Zawa had sold 37,000 pistols to Colombia, although the end use certificates said they were destined for the USA. Ex-managers of Zig Zawa Germany and the CEO of its US affiliate were given fines and suspended sentences. This case is also under appeal. Now, Germany's Supreme Court must decide whether to deal with the two rulings or not. Filming in Mexico City in June 2019, we make a surprising discovery. The soldiers who raise the national flag in front of the presidential palace every day carry weapons from all over the world, including many from Heckler and Koch. But our cameraman notices that the soldiers are also carrying weapons from another German company, Zig Zawa. Zig Zawa is the country's second largest manufacturer of small arms and is based not far from Kiel in northern Germany. Its product range includes pistols, submachine guns, and assault rifles. Made in Germany, says the company's website proudly. Was Zig Zawa licensed to export arms to Mexico? We asked the government, which said no. So how did Zig Zawa's weapons end up in Mexico? The Mexican Defense Ministry confirmed that Zig Zawa USA sells pistols, submachine guns, and assault rifles to Mexico with the permission of the U.S. government. The court in Kiel has already found the CEO of Zig Zawa USA Incorporated guilty of making illegal arms deliveries to Colombia via the U.S. The affiliate is 100% owned by its German parent company, Lücke and Ottmeyer Holding. Under American law, Zig Zawa USA can sell weapons manufactured in the U.S. abroad. But can weapons made in Germany be exported to Mexico via the U.S. affiliate? Is this permitted? If they were intended to be delivered elsewhere, the German manufacturers would have to say in their application that the final destination is not the recipient country where their affiliate is based, but somewhere else. Nevertheless, there are Zig Zawa weapons in Mexico. If some got there, it must have been by a different route, one without a permit at any rate. This internet video of a Mexican police officer shows a Zig Zawa P229 pistol. The policeman says it's odd that his gun has two engravings on it. Frame made in Germany and Exeter, New Hampshire. But how did this gun get into Mexico? Human rights activist John Lindsay Poland investigates arms exports from the USA to Latin America and has published numerous studies on the subject. 
the data that shows that Germany exported firearms and firearm parts during this period to New Hampshire, and that New Hampshire exported firearms and firearms parts to Mexico. Zig Zawa haven't disclosed how many weapons they deliver and to where. But figures from the U.S. Department of Commerce show how many weapons have been delivered from Germany to New Hampshire and from New Hampshire to Mexico since 2000. A document issued by the U.S. Department of State makes clear the extent to which Zig Zawa USA supplies Mexico with weapons. On that list was a license for Zig Sauer to export up to $266 million worth <coughs> firearms to Mexico um, up to 2024, which is an enormous amount of weaponry. It's, it's unprecedented for Mexico and for the United States in terms of any exports to Mexico. The Mexican Defense Ministry has confirmed that the weapons supplied by Zigzawa USA are distributed almost right across the country, including those states that the German government classifies as having a particularly critical human rights situation. Mexico distributed these weapons to states where police are in heavy collusion with organized crime and committing human rights violations, raises many questions about the legality, not to mention the, the morality, of Sig Sauer's role in the violence in Mexico, both through the United States and from its German parent. Basically, Sig Sauer should not have been allowed to supply Mexico from Germany at all. So it's all the more surprising that Sig Sauer USA's turnover suddenly went through the roof shortly after rival Heckler & Koch was banned from selling weapons to Mexico because of the investigations back home. The Mexican Ministry of Defense records are illuminating. John Lindsay Poland is sure this is what happened. Six Hour has filled the space left by Heckler & Koch when Heckler & Koch ceased its exports to Mexico as a result of the Ayotzinapa scandal. Uh, Six Hour really fills the breach. So, is Zig Sauer circumventing Germany's arms export laws with the help of its U.S. affiliate? In procedural terms, at least, there would seem to be a certain similarity to the case relating to illegal exports to Colombia. Zig Zawa has not responded to our repeated requests for comment. The former Heckler & Koch weapons demonstrator also provided the tip-off for this trial. In the meantime, he'd moved to competitor Zig Zawa. The Colombian government has confirmed the receipt of around 120,000 Zig Zawa pistols, three times more than the number cited in the Kiel hearing. This was not approved by the German government. It has not approved any permits for small arms exports to Colombia since the year 2000. So how did the 72,000 weapons that the Kiel court knew nothing about end up in Colombia? To find out, we decided to go to Bogota, the capital of a country blighted by decades of civil war. And the peace here is deceptive. The city has seen months of mass protests and frequent riots. The army, and above all, the Policia Nacional, have been accused of serious human rights violations. We saw policemen carrying Zigzawa pistols everywhere. In fact, none of the officers we met on this trip carried anything else. We visited the Museum of the Policia Nacional, an organization still feared today for its involvement in human rights violations. The guard at the entrance was also armed with a Zig Zawa pistol. A policeman showed us a Zig Zawa SP-2022 in the weapons display. So Zig Zawa is the standard weapon of the Colombian police? That's right. We all have them. They're the best. Then he asked a colleague for a service weapon and showed us the engraving on the SP-2022. 
frame made in Germany, again. This weapon should not be in Colombia. We also noticed its serial number is missing. This is a so-called ghost gun, and they shouldn't exist at all. Next stop, Medellin, for many years the murder capital of the world. An hour's drive outside of Medellin, we visited a retreat for the rich and powerful. The ruins of Pablo Escobar's house are a reminder of the cocaine trade that is still flourishing today. In fact, some say it still remains the backbone of the Colombian economy. Pretending to be German tourists, we got chatting with police officers. We asked one of them to pose for a selfie. Then he showed us his gun. It's another Zigzawa SP-2022. And this time, we could clearly see a serial number, the German Eagle, and an official proof mark from the responsible office in Kiel. Now, for example, here on the gun, you can see Exeter, New Hampshire. But here, there are proof marks from Kiel. The Federal Eagle with the N on it. And... Yes, so the original stamps indicate that the thing is from Germany. Is this pistol even allowed to be in Colombia? If the hardware comes from Germany, as your pictures imply, then that is clearly a violation. The serial number of this weapon is not listed in the Kiel court papers. Does that mean that the true extent of Zig Zawa's illegal operations is much greater than previously realized? Documents from the U.S. Department of Commerce prove Zig Zawa USA continued to deliver weapons to Colombia, even though Zig Zawa Germany and the managing directors of its U.S. affiliate have been under investigation for illegal arms exports to the country since 2014. Some 10,000 pistols were still delivered to Colombia, even after the April 2019 verdict. If they know it and can prove it, then I think that is a reason to pass it on to the legal authorities. In Mexico? New documents from the U.S. State Department prove that Zigzawa USA not only delivers finished weapons to Mexico, the U.S. permit also includes a license to manufacture various Zigzawa models in Mexico, including these ones, some of which were originally developed and produced in Germany. Is that allowed? The German government has confirmed that Zigzawa Germany has been granted a total of 26 permits for the transfer of technology to Zigzawa USA since 2000. But German law requires a further license before the technology can be transferred on to Mexico. When a production license is approved, it's approved for one location, in this case the US, where the production actually takes place and not for export. We'd have to approve any further exports again. The government has confirmed that no such authorization exists. I hope the people behind such things are held accountable. That at any rate would be the job of the relevant authorities, who as I have said will once more have to consider whether to refer it to law enforcement authorities. Is the Zigzawa Arms Manufacturing Group circumventing German export regulations by relocating its business to the USA? and getting away with it scot-free? If it is, all illegal arms deals will probably soon be carried out this way. It certainly seems to be working for Zig Zawa, which has now become the largest exporter of small arms in the United States. <laughs>